COVID-19 has, without a doubt, brought about a new set of problems that all of us have been trying to come to grips with. And I think maybe the last comment from Prof is very, very uh, applicable here, whereby we actually need to have an open set of mind to be able to view all options available to see how we can solve problems. I'm saying this because in managing an education institution, in providing a leadership by influencing other people so we can be able to achieve our set goals of delivering effective quality education, COVID-19 brought in new demands and to say the least, one can say that it has had managers, whether they believe, be, they believe it or whether they want to accept it or not, running hater skater, trying to ensure that there is quality education provision. In the midst of all of that, there's been so much that has is required to be done in a very short, short, short time. As a matter of fact, one can say that the disruption in education has been so vast that right now it is very, very difficult to even know or to be certain of what will happen after a certain process. For example, in South Africa, in every two weeks, the president would come and have an announcement and tell us where we're going. So meaning that plans were reduced to be bi-weekly because in the next presentation by the president, you might find that the school needs to be closed. So this has brought in, as I've said, so many undesirable effects. And the impact that COVID has had is that now managers are really in a state of attention. They have to watch what they do and be careful with everything they are planning. They can no longer plan for the whole year and sit back. The planning is constant, on the go. And the impact that COVID is having on everybody today is not limited to any level of school because right now irrespective of your age your gender or even a position in an institution you have to keep on revising and changing what you're doing with regards to ensuring we've got quality education colleges like where i am have now been forced to actually start doing remote learning. So there is a lifeline for students during this pandemic, pandemic, regardless of whether the situation will change in two weeks or not. And this has led to the increase in the use of technology, just like we're using technology today, such that even lectures that we used to call technophobia are now warming up and are starting to use technology in their classrooms and even in meetings like this. It is apt to say that online learning has now had a very profound effect on society and also on what they consider as learning and the way they learn and where they learn and how they perceive learning to be taking place. So, the biggest problem that we had was the fact that we had series of lockdowns. A lot of uncertainty. And then we were obviously driven to start implementing remote learning due to social distancing requirements because we're no longer allowed to have so many students on campus. 
Some students had to be at home, but at home doing what? That is when remote learning had to be put into gear. And now it is commonplace for there to be remote learning each time there is a serious lockdown. So my study was to try and establish, although we know and we can see, but to try and establish empirically that really there is an impact from COVID on teaching and learning. So, what was there, we looked at various factors, such as how lecturers who've had so much experience online, how lecturers who input innovation in their teaching and learning, and then we also looked at remote readiness. And the question was, is there any relationship between the innovation in teaching and learning, the educator online experience, which has always been there, and how ready they were for remote teaching? Another consideration was, is there any link between the biographical data and remote readiness? That is, looking at the age of a sample, the gender, and various other demographics. Now, this study obviously needed something like a survey, which could be given out to a large number of people. And because of that, and because of what I have earlier mentioned, I saw and we concluded this is going to be a correlational research. Now, here, what it meant is now one will be looking for the various factors which could be interacting with each other. And one had to dig deep down to see if there was any way of there being interaction amongst the factors uh, in the sample. However, the only um, sad point about it is that, as you all know, in um, correlation research, one has no control of the factors. So we just have to take the factors as they were. My sample also was full and rich. And one had to really dig deep down in the sample to see what the sample was going to give us. How were these uh, people in the sample different? And what would they bring in to the study? I used um, a four point Likert scale, which we'll refer to later as well. But after looking at the sample, this is what came out. Um, naturally, or should I say, most of the time, teachers are women. So yes, the most significant uh, participant, participants were women, reaching about 56.1%. Then the greatest age group was in a range of 26 to 44. And they made up about 70.1%. If you look at them, these are called the Generation Y. And I want to say something about Generation Y. Generation Y is said to be that group of people who were actually born between 1981 to 1996. And these people love mobile devices, according to worldwide surveys. And they typically have more than one social media account. 
they are really a very powerful uh, group of people and are very influential. And we may see some of these effects trickling down in the main research. The population was large in African with 95.1%. And then based on qualifications, found that 26.8% was uh, given to people with honors degrees. In South Africa, we normally have, after finishing 12 years of compulsory school, we normally have people going in for a degree which is normally about <laughs> three years. Then after that, you have the honors degree. So it meant that these people had been to school, got a, a, a university degree, and then went back again and got an honors. Then we had lecturers comprising 78% of the sample. Uh, remember in the group, we had lecturers, there was managers, there were IT technicians and various other stakeholders, but 78% of them were lecturers, which makes the sample rich enough for us. Then looking at what is termed here as rotation, here we're talking about how do they come to work? You see, after lockdown, everything has changed. It's not just straightforward. So in some cases, we have some groups of people who work from home. Then there's some people who come to work on certain days and stay at home working on certain days. Now, you can see that the majority here, 88% were coming to work occasionally. They were not working from home. Then when they were asked the question, when do you think there will be full online learning or remote learning, most of them said uh, 2022. And when we asked them, do you think there's any need of change? Almost everybody said, yes, we must change. We cannot continue the way it is. So like I said, 43.9% said change would be in 2022. Some said it would be within the next six months. Some said in the next four years, but the majority, which was 43.9%, said it would happen in the coming year. Looking at the same demographics and trying to see some association with remote readiness, we actually found that on a scale of one to four, where obviously on a scale of one to four, when we say we've got a four, it means that the person strongly agrees with the concept. And when it's a one, it means that they strongly disagree with the concept. So the midpoint there is somewhere around 2.5. And looking at 2 to around 2.49 as partially disagree, and looking at 2.51 to 2.99 as partially agree, then you would see that a 2.56 rating or average meant that more males were saying that, yes, uh, we are prepared for remote learning. However, when it came to age groups, the most significant result was obtained from the age group of the generation Z, which was 18 to 25 year olds. They had 2.93 and they were in agreement with remote readiness telling us that actually it looks like people who are younger are more ready for this. And within the same sample, our white colleagues was 2.78, were more ready for remote readiness. Then students, oh sorry, lecturers with a qualification was just a post-secondary school certificate fully agreed because they had 3.11 that they were ready for remote learning. 
For managers, it was about 2.58 that partially agreed that yes, they were ready. And you would obviously think that uh, managers should really have a full um, idea of the impact this would have on schooling. So, yeah. Then when we asked everybody else if they were really ready for remote learning, over 2.56 said they were partially in agreement. When asked if um, colleges would be ready for remote learning in 2022, the mean was 2.74, which meant that they were in agreement, uh, partially agreeing, so, so to say. And with the working arrangements being um, ready for remote readiness, 2.56 said, yes, rotation was working and could continue working. So, given that kind of a background, um, it was now time to go deep down to look at these variables. One of the things that was also done here was we did a factor analysis to actually dig deeper to look at the various elements of the research and to see the impact that was going on. Then here we've got innovation in teaching and learning. We found that actually when you looked at teachers or lecturers being able to think independently of any group, which was um, ITL4, it had the most significant result of three. And when we moved over to the next set of parameters, which was the educator online experience, we found that um, being able to ensure that we have continuity of studying in a lockdown, which was EOE9, gave us 3.39, which means that this variable agreed with the fact that we could have um, remote learning. When we need to remote learning itself at the parameters, we found here that actually, because of the collaboration that was going on during COVID, it was possible to do remote learning. You can see that we had here 2.9, it had the highest result. Now, if we look at the summary, if we look at the summary here of the model, found that, yes, we tried to predict what would happen, and we found that, yes, for remote learning, the predictors were online experience and innovation in teaching and learning and it was significant now in in education we normally take a d size of around 0 0.4 to have medium effect and here we found that we had 0 0.434 so therefore it was able we were able to predict 43% of the effects, according to Cohen. When we looked at the ANOVA, we also found here, once again, that the multiple regression was significant as well. And therefore, one could say that innovation and online experience statistically predicted the remote readiness of the colleges. So in conclusion, one could say that the multiple regression was run to predict the remote readiness from innovation in teaching and learning and educator online experience. 
and our results as shown do indicate that it was statistically significant and that the two variables added statistically to a prediction at a P of 95%. Yes, and that concludes the study. As you can see, the results, in short, we did find an association between innovative teaching and learning. We found that in the data, biographic data, there was some agreement with remote readiness. And we could also predict and have a model after we were able to analyze and um, run the tests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And we would like to give the big hand to our Muslim CEO, sir, for such a wonderful presentation. We would like to request each and everyone to give the big hand for such a brilliant presentation in this World Summit Source 2021.